In this video, we'll be exploring three simple counting problems that will teach you powerful principles and guidelines for approaching and solving more complex counting problems. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced mathematician, hopefully you'll find valuable insights and strategies in these examples that will help you tackle even the most challenging counting problems with ease. Ideally, you should give each of these problems a try before I explain the solution. This way, if you make any mistakes, you can directly compare your approach with the solution, which will help you better understand what concepts you're missing or where your intuition needs to be honed. Only one solution will be presented for each of these problems. There are plenty of other ways to solve each of them. If you have any other approaches, feel free to share them in the comments. I have a network of roads connecting Naples to Rome. How many ways can a traveling merchant get from Naples to Rome if they are not allowed to take a road more than once, but they are allowed to cross over a road they have taken before? Take a minute and give the problem a try. We could just try to list out all of the possible paths, but we run into a little problem. How do we make sure we haven't overcounted, and how do we make sure we haven't undercounted? Making sure we haven't overcounted is easy. We just check that no path is counted twice. Undercounting, however, is a little bit trickier in this problem. We will first give names to each of our paths in such a way that the names tell us how the path is selected. By showing that we have covered every possible name, we can guarantee that we have not undercounted. Notice that no matter what, we need to start by taking this road first, and our last step will be taking this road here. So as long as we start on this point and end on this point, we will have a valid path. Let's call these points P and Q. Let's label each of the three rows from P to Q as A, B, and C. All we have to do now is label each path by listing the order in which the roads A, B, and C are taken. For example, this path would be labeled B. This path would be labeled A, B, C. What do we know about these path names? Since each road cannot be traveled twice, each letter can only appear at most once. We also know that from either P or Q, we can select any of the three roads. Finally, the number of roads we select must be odd. As long as we take one of these roads, we're switching between P and Q. An even number of roads would take us back to P, and not to the destination Q. Therefore, each path name must consist of either one road or three roads. All we need to do is list all of the permutations of the three roads and each of the single roads. We now have a pairing, or bijection, between our paths and our names, so there must be the same number of paths as names, giving us a final total of nine paths. Did you get the right answer? If you did, great. If you didn't, that's okay. Most people will miss a couple of paths and then not bother to check if their answer is correct. Even though there are only 9 paths, a number that is literally countable with just one's fingers, it is very easy to undercount. And so we need to remember to check our answer, even when the problem seems this simple. What we did here may seem complicated and excessive, but it allowed us to rigorously demonstrate the validity of our solution. For a more general description of what it means to check the answer to a counting problem, check out my previous video. Link is in the description. How many partitions of 7 are there? A partition of 7 is an unordered set of positive integers that add up to 7. Here are some examples. Be careful though. Notice on the right, we count all of these as the same partition, because the partition doesn't care what order the numbers are in. Take a minute and give this problem a try. So I have a student that gave a solution by simply listing out all of the partitions. Can you see why the student's approach is flawed? The way this list is presented here makes it very difficult for us to verify the answer. To verify we haven't overcounted or undercounted, we should organize how we write each partition as well as organize the entire list. We begin by setting a rule such that any time we write a partition, we always list the numbers from greatest to least. This way, any set of numbers is written uniquely. We can easily tell if two partitions are the same by just checking that they are written exactly the same. Next, we order these partitions from greatest to least, so that if any partitions are in fact identical, they will end up right next to each other. Oh hey, we found an overcounting mistake. Let's remove the partition that was listed twice. We are now left with 13 partitions. 
Ordering the partitions like this also makes it easy to check for any partitions that we've missed. We just check the gaps between the partitions. For instance, we know we didn't miss anything between these two partitions, because any sum that does fit in between cannot add up to 7. By checking the gap between each partition, we find 2 that we missed, which brings the final count to 15. As you can see, reordering or organizing a list can be a great tool for checking for overcounting and undercounting. Good problem solvers know how to utilize tools like this to arrive at an answer. How many unique ways can I order four keys on a keychain? To be clear, all of the keys are different, and all of the keys must be added to the keychain. As usual, take a minute to give this problem a try. Let's pretend there are four empty slots on the keychain, which we will fill with keys. Let's first label our keys A through D just to make them easier to describe and see. The first slot has four options, as any key can go in there. The second slot has three options, since one of the keys is already used, and so on. The total number of orderings of the keys into the keychain would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 4 factorial. This gives us a total of 24 keychains. Alright, that sounds about right. But is it really? Let's now check for overcounting and undercounting. Since every possible ordering of the keys has been counted, we know for a fact that we have not undercounted. Overcounting, however, is a little bit trickier. Remember that keys on a keychain can slide around. If we simply rotate our keychains like so, we can see that all of the keychains can be rotated such that the key on the top is A. We can now see that every keychain was listed four times, because there are four rotations. We can now fix this overcounting by simply dividing by four, leaving us with six keychains. That must be the full solution, right? Let's check one more time to see if there's any other trap we can fall into. Look at these two keychains. Picking up one of the keychains, I can flip it around. Notice that these keychains are the same. We have already checked for rotational symmetry in the keychains, but we didn't check for reflection symmetry yet. Each keychain and its flip has been counted, so to fix this overcounting, we just divide by 2, giving us a final answer of 3. Even though we started with 24 permutations, by dividing out symmetry, that was reduced to simply 3. Think about this for a moment. All one needs to do to solve this problem is to count these 3 keychains. How can a counting problem that seems this simple be so tricky? Getting to the right answer in these problems is great, but hopefully we can also see why it is crucially important that we justify our answer. And that's part of what makes these counting problems more difficult than they initially seem. If you'll stay with me for just a little bit longer, let's reflect a little now and talk about what makes counting problems difficult. Hopefully, we'll be able to appreciate the nuances and be a lot more confident at solving them. Let's talk about what makes counting problems difficult. There are two major parts to solving a counting problem, figuring out what you're counting and figuring out how to count it. Depending on the problem, either or both of these could be tricky. Let's go into more detail. What does it mean to know what you're counting? For starters, we need to be able to visualize some kind of representation of it. We should know what it looks like in this sense. If an arbitrary representation is given, we should be able to identify whether or not this representation is a part of the list we're counting. In other words, be able to identify if something is or isn't something we want to count. Secondly, you should be able to tell whether two objects on your list are considered the same or different. What does it mean for two keychains to be the same keychain? If you can't tell if two keychains are different, how can you be sure you're not overcounting? The keychain question in particular is sneaky because it didn't give explicit mathematical rules as to what counts as a unique keychain. When you get math problems that reference objects and concepts in the real world, such as with a keychain problem, you have to be a bit careful and clearly answer this question. Without deeply understanding what we're counting, we will have little direction in figuring out how to count it. Now let's talk about figuring out how to count something. Perhaps there's a formula we can use, or some clever transformation of the problem. Maybe we don't know any technique and we have to use the last resort of manually listing everything and counting. Every time we learn a counting theorem or formula, we are adding to this toolset that we can use. We need to find a subset of tools that will crack the problem. 
Here is where we need to check our answer, not only to see how much we need to adjust our overcounting and undercounting, but also to check that we are even applying the formulas correctly, that we are using the correct tools to crack the problem. Hopefully, these simple counting problems have demonstrated some clear examples of what it means to count rigorously and how we should go about doing it. Just because the problems seem simple doesn't mean they're easy, and just because they're tricky doesn't mean they can't be made simple. Now, if you would like more practice, I'm going to put three more problems on the screen. While these problems are being shown, I'd like to take a minute to ask for your support. I would like to spend a lot more time working on videos like this and more, but my time is limited. Financial support would allow me to upload more videos at a faster rate. Any donation that you are comfortable giving me would be greatly appreciated, either through here on YouTube or on my Patreon, which will be linked in the description. Please don't feel any pressure to donate. I would like to keep all of my content free for everyone, especially those who don't have the means to pay. If you can't donate, another way to help is to simply hit like, subscribe, and share my videos. Thanks for your views, and I'll see you next time.